From the wells of our souls springs forth Christ's call for us, a mission of love, peace, and justice. We are asked to return to our roots and recommit to the cleansing waters of our baptism, which allow us to rise to a new understanding and spur us toward resurrecting the mission that Christ sets before us.
Good morning. I wouldn't have minded listening to it again, actually. But good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship here at Linwood this morning. We're glad that you are all here to celebrate God's gift of life and to gather together as a community of faith today. I want to welcome you on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend, or as students and teachers like to call it, the beginning of the end of school, right? <laughs> It's almost over, hang on, just four more days. You can do it. We are glad that you're here. Whether you are a first time guest or a long time worshiper, we pray that you're touched by the presence of God this morning and that all of us are renewed, reinvigorated for God's vision, God's mission as we worship this morning. If you are a guest with us for the first time, there are connection cards at the back of your chairs and also on the table as you exit. Or if you just have some new information, like you've moved or you have a new phone number, you can always uh, put that on the connection card so that we can stay um, in connection with you. Um, as we move into our worship today, I just want to acknowledge that we bring a lot of different emotions to worship. This is always true. I think that it is very, very true on this particular day. There is a lot of grief, a lot of fear, a lot of outrage over the deaths of so many at Robb Elementary School this week. There is anger and fear and outrage over what many perceive as political inaction. There's also a deep desire among many of us to honor loved ones who have died in war, to remember the reality of Memorial Day. In the midst of all of that, all of that grief, all of that turmoil, there's beauty, there's wonder, there's music, there's life. Right? It's beauty and hardship, always together. So I just want to acknowledge the reality of that as we enter into worship today and invite us to just pause for a moment of silence, to lift up all of those things to God. Amen. And now I would invite you to stand in body or in spirit. Let's join in this morning's call to worship. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Renew our worn out hopes. Restore our forgotten dreams. Come, Prince of Peace, come. Refashion our commitment to a world of peace and justice. Come, wonderful counselor, come. Rekindle our joy for living and refuel our passion for truth. Come, giver of life, come. Resurrect our yearning for you and your mission of grace. Please remain standing and join in our opening hymn, Come Christians, Join to Sing.
Let us take a deep breath, close our eyes, and receive this prayer for peace and new life. Redeeming God, you bring life out of dead ends and hope in the midst of despair. Forgive us for doubting that you are still at work, even in the most painful moments. Forgive us for our hesitant action, our cautious compassion, our too frequent reluctance. Redeeming God, teach us a stillness that leads to acts of kindness and clarity of vision. Shape in us a trust that leads to faithful witness and bold compassion. Form us in your love that loosens our worry and eases our anger. Make us true disciples filled with love, acting with justice, and living with hope. Amen. Amen. During times like these, it's important to remember that we're a community that gathers in love and peace. So when you look into each other's eyes, spread that unending hope, that redeeming peace, that purest of love to one another this morning. So may the peace of a resurrected Christ be with you all. Our reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. From me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Thanks be to God. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And just like that, Jesus was gone. It's this interesting moment in the life of the church that we call the ascension, the last known sighting, the last known experience of the resurrected presence of Christ among his first disciples. For 40 days following his crucifixion, they'd been able to hold their grief and confusion over his death at bay because they were wrestling instead with these very unexpected experiences of a presence among them, a being, an experience that did not look like Jesus but felt very much like the Lord. So much so that they became convinced that this Jesus was living 
a resurrected presence among them. But just like that, 40 days after experiencing this grace all over again, he tells them to go be powerful witnesses to the ends of the earth, and he's gone, never to be experienced like that again. I wonder what they felt. Confusion, fear, anger, bewilderment, maybe terror. I bet they asked themselves, what in the world are we supposed to do now? The book of Acts says that what they did was go back to Jerusalem. They went back to the upper room where they had all been living together following the crucifixion. There were the 11 original apostles. There were the women who followed Jesus. There was Mary, Jesus' mother, and Jesus' brothers. And at least at some point, the book of Acts says, there were 120 other believers, and they were all gathered together. They prayed. I imagine they spent a lot of time thinking and wondering, trying to make sense of what had happened over these 40 days. All we know is that they stayed in this room for 10 days, that time period of waiting between the last sighting of the resurrected Christ and that moment of baptism by Holy Spirit fire that we call Pentecost. Sometime during that 10-day period, they stopped looking back and reflecting on what had been. They stopped looking up, waiting on Jesus to come back and they began to look around at one another. Peter, the rock of the church, stepped forward and said, listen, we need to do something. We need to get ready. Jesus called 12 disciples, we're down one, let's elect another. They formed a committee, see, that's what church people do. (laughs) When in doubt, form a committee. The committee elected Matthias, and now there were 12 again, and they waited. But in that time of waiting, I think the Spirit was already at work. The Spirit was already helping them step into a new reality. As they stopped looking up to heaven, they began to look around at one another, and they realized that resurrected presence was still very much there within them and among them. They began to think about the world outside of that locked room, and they realized that vision of the kingdom of God that Jesus came to teach and live, the world still needed it. Even as they waited on the Spirit, the Spirit was resurrecting them, was restoring their sense of mission and purpose as followers of Jesus Christ. I think there are moments in all of our faith journeys when we too need to pause for a moment, to reflect, to reconsider how we might resurrect that sense of mission and purpose as followers of Jesus Christ. We have been waiting for a couple of years to gather again as an active church and to go out into the world as witnesses to to Christ's love and compassion. So this seems to be one of those times, a time to reconsider again what it means to be the resurrected, embodied presence of Christ for the world. For me, when I begin to wonder about my own sense of mission and purpose as a follower of Jesus, it helps to go back a little bit. It helps to go back and remember what first compelled me to follow Christ. And for me, that has everything to do with his presence and his vision for the world. So I want you to think, if you can, you might have to go back to childhood, think to a really early experience of an encounter with the presence of Christ. Maybe something really simple, like you remember a grandparent reading a Bible story to you, or you remember a time of worship, a time of prayer. Maybe you went to church camp as a kid. 
a couple of weeks ago in staff meeting, I suddenly remembered a time that I answered, get ready for this, an altar call in a Southern Baptist revival. <laughs> Hand to God, it happened. I was in second grade, and my best friend Shelby, her dad was a preacher at this Southern Baptist church, and they had asked me to come to this Sunday night revival, and so I came, and I don't remember all of the preaching at all, but I do remember at the end of a lot of talk, all of these men gathered in front of the sanctuary, and they said, if anybody wants to give their lives to Christ, they can come forward now, and we'll lay hands on you, we'll pray for you, and you know, you'll know be dedicated to Christ. Now, I mean, I was baptized at age one. I spent every Sunday in church, but I felt this urge, this inexplicable pulling to come forward, and like a voice that said, you need to do this. Now, I have heard from a lot of people they experience the Holy Spirit in this way, like a nudge, just an urging to take action, to do something. At that time, when I was eight years old, I really didn't know what it was all about, but I decided, as intimidating as it looked, I was gonna go forward. So I got up and I, I knelt down and I remember these men gathering around me and they asked me why I was there. Well, I had no words to explain to them why I was there, which they were not very happy about, really, but they prayed for me nonetheless. And as I went back to my seat, I had this sense of peace and calm. There was something in me that knew somehow Jesus wanted an eight-year-old kid like me. I was affirmed and loved. And I think that's what all of us feel in the presence of Christ. It was always that way. Think about the stories that we know from scripture. Just think about one, the story of the woman at the well that's shared in the Gospel of John. Right? She's someone who, by any stretch of any of imagination, should not have been affirmed by the divine. Right? She's a Samaritan, a longtime enemy of Israel. She worships in the wrong way, the wrong God in the wrong place, and we know her life is a little bit suspect. She is socially ostracized. And yet Jesus comes to her and sees something pure and true in her. So much so that she goes back to town and she says, come and see. Come and see a man who knows everything about me and loves me anyway. Jesus sees us, even now. Jesus sees the very best in us and calls it forward. I think that there must have been something compelling about the way he looked, even at complete strangers, that made them want to know more. I think that when he listened to people, he must have listened beyond what they said to the deeper yearnings of their hearts. They knew they were in the presence of someone that loved them deeply and yet could still challenge them to be better. If they were abusing power, they could be restored to mercy and right living. I know this because I think we still experience the presence of Christ this way. It doesn't have to be mystical and supernatural. It might just be that good feeling we have when we leave church, after we've been in the presence of others gathered in the name of Christ, and we walk out into the world and we feel somehow different, somehow better. That's the impact of the presence of Christ. And we need that presence to fuel our action in the world, to fuel the vision that Christ has for the world. Jesus called his vision for the world the kingdom of God. And he says in the gospels that that kingdom is fulfilled in him, in his living, in his teaching. If that's true, then we know what the kingdom of God is meant to be. 
We know what life on earth is supposed to look like. It looks like the hungry being fed, the thirsty receiving water. It looks like the poor and the lonely and the lost and the least being lifted up and restored with dignity. It looks like those who are powerful being told they don't have to abuse their power, they can live lives of justice and mercy. It looks like every human being, every child, every woman, every man, every person of every background living up into their divine potential, realizing the sacred within themselves and in others. This is how Jesus lived And it was a vision that so compelled those first disciples that they left that upper room. They went out into the world, not just to save souls. They did that. They taught about Jesus. They tried to build a new community. But they also healed people. They fed people. In fact, If you read some of the the history, the Roman Empire was so angry at early Christians because of their charity. It was their extreme love for the poor that got them into trouble. This is the vision that still compels us. And I think it's safe to say that without those first disciples resurrecting the mission, Without their belief that the resurrected Christ was present in them, we wouldn't really be here. The movement would have ended thousands of years ago. So I'm just curious, can we name the first disciples? This is like one of those things where you ask a congregation to name the Ten Commandments and everybody goes, "Uh, thou shalt not, right? Can we name the the 12 disciples? Now, I'm gonna tell you the truth. I have it written down here because I'm not sure I could name them either. That's how bad it is. But let's see, what can we do? Peter, Peter, right? I already named them. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Matthias, Thomas, Judas. Well, we're really good, we're really good. Matthew, did somebody say Matthew? And Philip? And then there's this other kind of strange Bartholomew slash Nathaniel. He went by both names. There's a lot of that in scriptures too. Really good. Now, let's see if we can name beyond the first 12. Who are some other disciples? Paul? Mary Magdalene, maybe? Keep going, name some more. I'm gonna get, I'm looking for anybody. Okay, now we're on to it. Look around. Name some disciples. Sherilyn, Pearl, Jennifer. God, I hope so, right? Despite all our faults, all of our failings, right? We are the disciples for this time and this place. We are supposed to be the church. The church is nothing but the resurrected, embodied presence of Christ in this time and this place, sent forth to be the powerful witnesses for Christ for his presence, for his vision. I think the world needs our witness, doesn't it? Look at our world, look at our world. And when I say that, I don't mean just look at what's broken. I mean, let's really look at our world. There is a lot that is truly beautiful I mean, I see so much love and goodness and service and care among so many of us. And our creation is still abundant and resilient and amazing. When we just got back from a camping trip, 
and Pinecrest, and we went out to Immigrant Wilderness, and it is phenomenally beautiful and scarred with the charred remains of wildfires everywhere. In the midst of pine trees and granite, there's hill after hill of just blackened stumps and blackened trees. And that's the reality of our world, isn't it? It's beautiful and it's broken. As we know so very well, the violence, the hate, the division of the last couple of weeks, and the absolute devastation of elementary school children being killed at school. We live in a world that needs our witness to the love and the peace of Christ. It seems to me, though, the church for a really long time has gotten it a little bit backwards. When we tend to talk about the mission of the church, right, it seems to always be about building bigger churches, making better worship services, making sure that there are more people inside the church. That's all good. But Jesus did not say, I'm sending you to the synagogue to read Torah and sing songs. He did not say, I'm sending you into the church to create the most beautiful worship service the world has ever known. He said, I'm sending you out into the world. I'm sending you out there to relate to people, to help them discover their own divine potential, their own connection to the presence of God, to share a vision of the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven. We tend to think that the church has a mission. I just think that's backwards. God's mission has a church. We are not the ends. We are the means by which God's dream comes true. What is God's dream? I mean, God's dream was embodied in Jesus, right? It's a world without violence. On his last night on earth, when his own disciple tried to use violence to save his life, he healed that soldier and said, no more of this. No more violence. It's a world without hate. It's a world without racism. It's a world without poverty. It really is a world of safety for all of us, where all of us can become who God has called us to be. I'm gonna be the first to tell you, I don't always know what it means to be a witness for the way of Christ. I get myself all kind of caught up in, well, what will work? But lately I've been realizing that's not really our job, is it? Our job is to be witnesses. Our job is to let our words and our lives reflect what we know to be true about the love and grace of Jesus Christ. The work of transforming the world, of changing hearts and lives, that's the Spirit's work. That's not our job at all. So I don't have any big recommendations on what we might do to witness to this better world, although I will tell you I have called all of our Methodist clergy together for a meeting to begin talking about that. So hopefully, stay tuned, right? But for this week, maybe we can just begin where we are. Begin each day by asking yourself, how can I witness to your love today, God? Wherever I go, whomever I'm with, How can my words, how can my actions witness to your presence, to your vision of a better world? I think it at least begins with that. It doesn't end there, but it begins with that. So let's be a people of prayer, a people of witness, a people who are ready to go out into the world and to let people know the God that we see in Jesus. 
Amen. course, we do hold deeply in our hearts those who are grieving, those who are grieving the loss of children, grieving the loss of loved ones this week. Um, invite us to be in prayer with one another. God of all creation, God of all people, we offer you our thanks that you hold our hearts in yours, that you promise to hear our prayers. We lift up to you that the joys, the joys of living, the joys of loving one another, of being in community, of celebrating your gift of life. And we lift up our concerns, concerns for those who are ill, concerns for those who are grieving. We hold in our hearts this morning, especially the parents, the families of children killed this week in Texas. We lift up all those who grieve the loss of loved ones to violence. Lord, our hearts are simply broken by the pain and the cruelty that we sometimes see in our world. We pray that you would heal our hearts, that you would fill us with moral courage to do something, to do something that is within our power to do for the sake of our children, for the sake of our world. We also pray on this memorial weekend for our servicemen and women for all who have gone before them, even as we honor their sacrifice and dedication. Make us mindful. Make us mindful of the incredible cost of war. Give us courage to work for peace through dialogue and understanding. Help us to seek nonviolent solutions in our personal lives, in our communities, in our world, so that life might truly flourish for all of us. Make us witnesses to your compassionate way, God, with our words and our deeds. In our hearts and through our hands, let your kingdom come. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you're comfortable and join us in singing our closing hymn, Go to the World.
Before our closing blessing, I want to invite all of you who would like to follow me during the postlude out to the Memorial Garden. I'm not sure if everyone even knows we have a Memorial Garden out there, um, but we do, and we're gonna really close our service out there in the Memorial Garden today, offering a prayer for those that we wanna lift up in our own congregation and those, um, those servicemen and women all around us. So now may the love of God the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit empower you to be faithful witnesses to our risen and resurrecting God. Go in peace and love. Amen. Amen.